I'm Sebastian St. James. A huge crash is coming to the US in the next few weeks and it's time to pull your money out right now. That is the concern of one of my viewers. He asks, should I convert my US dollars into Australian dollars? I have a Schwab account, however, I watch a lot of YouTube. USA seems a bit of a worry. What do you reckon? Is the US falling apart? Should we take our money and come home to Australia for safety? That is the question I'll be answering in this video, as well as... Number two, is there a way of contacting you directly? The parts I didn't read out from his question we've covered in the previous video. Well, let's take a look. This is IVV, which is an S&P 500 ETF. It is in American dollars, because it's the American version of the index. And this is this week, you can notice. Down, 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 yep, yeah, yeah, down. Wow, what happened there on the 17th? And coming up slightly, but a really bad week overall. This is the S&P 500 year to date. And down, 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 yeah, more down, and just, you know, it tries to recover, and then more down. Thank you very much. That is an absolute disaster. The US share market is definitely in a steep decline, and that is a bit of a worry. Not to mention the inflation. Actually, let's do mention the inflation. Back in 2018, the inflation rate in the US was 2.07%. In 2019, it was 1.55%. Oh, imagine that. Less than 2%. It's like some fantasy world where everything is made up. In 2020, the US inflation was 2.49%. In 21, it was 1.4%. Look at that. And suddenly, in January 1st of 2022, it was 7.48%. And now, it is 7.75%. Wow. Well, that is terrible news if you hate inflation, and you should hate inflation. I mean, the Reserve Fed does. Why wouldn't you? Now, how are Americans actually reacting to this? What's happened to their wages? Have they gone up with inflation? <laughs> no, their real wage, that means after inflation is counted in, has had a steep decline. And then you can have a look at it. It's gone down minus 2.3% after inflation. That is a precipitous drop. Sheer cliff, here I come. This is Meta. You may know this is Facebook. Over the last 12 months, it has gone, oh, down, down, more down, and more down. A disaster. Oh, the 2022 midterms. US voters say fixing the economy is top priority. Voters are quite familiar with the problem facing the economy. This election, they want candidates who have solutions. Right, so even the average American is majorly concerned. What's with this stupid economy? It feels weak. People can't afford as much. Wages aren't keeping up with inflation, which remains at a 40-year high. Mortgage rates reached a 20-year high. The average is over 7% for the first time since 2002. It's expensive enough that people are eating a lot more at McDonald's, even though the prices of their burgers is up too. Eating more at McDonald's. What has happened to the US? I thought they did that anyway. That and going to Starbucks every 30 minutes. So we've shown for sure there are troubles with the US. The S&P 500 has crashed. Inflation is at near record highs. Real income has crashed. Yes, that's a big concern. Meta has crashed. US voters say fixing the economy is the top priority. The economy has gone stupid. And James is worried about the US. James? Who's James? James, of course, is the person who asked the questions for this video. The entire video is based around him. Uh, hang on. Didn't James just have an entire video dedicated to him like a couple of videos ago? How come he's getting a second one? What is he bribing you or something? This I decided to investigate. If I look him up, yes, James is one of my channel members. And specifically, he's part of the Jump the Question queue. What could that be? That appears to be a membership level where your questions will be first in line for me to create videos about. Skip the queue. Hmm, that seems rather handy. This is Worried Wendy. Worried Wendy invests in stocks and bonds, yes. Goes to cash if the market drops by 10%. Wow. Oh, that's a bit of concern. Worried, Wendy, you'd be going to cash like every month or so. Oh, it's true. She cashes out and buys gold on average every 40 days. Wow, you are worried. This is Smarty Pants Paul. Well, you've definitely got the right pants then. Firstly, what are all those headphones about that are hanging up there? And secondly, you've literally got nothing written on your whiteboard except for a smiley face. Hmm, I have concerns about you, Paul. Smiley Pants Paul believes he can predict the next crash with 100% accuracy, really. Proof, he got it right once, a whole once. Wow, that is impressive. He jumps from shares to Bitcoins and then to oil futures on average every 40 days. 
It strikes me that Worried Wendy and Smarty Pants Paul, although they come from a completely different emotional position, are more or less doing the same thing. Worried Wendy is like, oh, there's something going wrong with economy, I must flee. Smarty Pants Paul is, I think there's something going wrong with economy, I know better, I'll just hop over here. Emotionally totally different, but the results seem more or less the same. This is Stable Able. Stable Abel ignores the short-term hype. Interesting. He uses long-term statistics to choose the best asset classes. Well, that sounds like a smart thing to do. And he looks for stability. Hence the name Stable Abel, I guess. You'll notice that Stable Abel is driven by data and statistics. The other two are driven by emotion. The question is, which of those three personality types best describes you? Number one, I am mostly scared of what is going on in the economy and markets and feel safest with cash or gold. Well, that's a worried Wendy for sure. Secondly, I am mostly smarter than the sheeple and can quickly switch asset types to time the market. Well, that's definitely smarty pants Paul. And third, I mostly believe that long-term historical averages will probably repeat and so buy and hold assets with good track records. Well, that's definitely a stable label. In reality, you may not fit 100% into any of these personality types. You could be a bit of a mixture, like a 70% stable able and a 30% worried Wendy, something like that. Based on those investor types you most identify with will depend on how you should react to investments and the economy. Do you know your relationship with money partly comes from your parents and what they told you about money when they were growing up? My parents, for example, were always careful with their money. Spend less than you make, keep it in cash, put it in the bank, maybe term deposits, and that is about as far as they got. Now, while your relationship with money may be initially formed by your parents, as you become older, as you become more educated, if you become more educated over finance, you can then choose what type of investor you want to be. Do you want to be a worried Wendy? Do you want to be a smarty pants Paul? Or do you want to be a stable Abel? And if you're not, you can start to move towards that type. Based on your investor profile, here are some things you may want to think about. For the worried Wendy's out there, decide if investing is right for you. Would you feel more comfortable with a stable job and a savings account? This seems like crazy talk, particularly coming from me, who talks about investments all day, every day. What's gone wrong with you? Why is this goal? Go to cash and keep your money in the bank. There are some people for whom investments is really far too stressful, although statistically, if they were disciplined enough, they'd do much better if they put their money in the market, but it is not right for them. I had a senior level manager back when I used to work in finance who had about $3 million in his super, which he'd accumulated over his working lifetime. He said to me, I'm right, I'm set for life. I don't need to invest, just leave it in the bank. I know I've got more than enough money to last me through my retirement. Going 100% cash can be a valid enough position if you've got enough cash to last you through, which this guy certainly did, or for this type of worried Wendy, rather than investing in the market, oh, getting scared, going back to cash, investing in the market, oh, getting scared, maybe you're better off sticking in cash, getting yourself a good job, going up through the ranks and investing in your savings account. It's an option for you to think about. On the other hand, worried Wendy's could consider a broad mix, such as a third cash, a third bonds and a third index funds. So if you're worried, Wendy, should you actually have a foot in the market, a foot in, say, bonds, a foot in cash, because that's what you ultimately feel more comfortable with, and stay there for the long term, rather than jumping in and out all the time? It's something for you to consider. To the smarty pants pulls, execute your market beating strategies, but keep a log. Do you beat the market over, say, a 10 year period of time? If you're a smarty pants pull, then I want you to do this. What are your market beating strategies? Have you proven them over time? Actually recorded, proven that they work. Get out the graphs. Every month, compare, say, the S&P 500 to your own personal portfolio and see how they match up. It's no good having a religious conviction that shares should be invested in this particular way if the data of your own history actually shows it doesn't work out that way. If you're a smarty pants pull, then prove your strategy works over the long term. If you don't have a proven market beating strategy, perhaps go 90% buy and hold and leave 10% to play with. This is a strategy that virtually every investor type can actually implement. If you believe that there are ways of beating the market, and in theory there should be, but you're concerned that you may not actually be able to do it, then mostly don't, 
but keep some play money, keep 5%, 10%, whatever works for you to implement your strategies. Now, if you find that your strategies are actually working, then you can start to shift more money out. If you find they're not working, you can shift money back in, but that way you get the best of both worlds. You get to use your smarts, you get to use your research, plus you get to buy the market overall. Not a bad system. For the stable ables who are watching me right now, have you fully researched all your options and found the best historical returns? Ignore short-term crashes, trust the long-term statistics. This is what I do myself. I am a stable able. I trust the data over the long term. I have mapped it out. I have proven to myself and to my audience, video after video, what happens with the market over the long term. And therefore, if there's a short term dip, if there's a crash right now, has there been crashes in the past? The answer is yes. Has the market always recovered from them? Yes, it has. And therefore, I don't really care about day to day or even year to year drops because they're none of my business. They're statistically completely normal. So let's answer James' question. Should I convert my US dollars into Australian dollars? This could have two interpretations. Number one, which is the better currency to hold? So you could just be talking about currency pairs. Or secondly, which is the better economy to be invested in? I suspect he's asking question number two, but I'll answer both just to make sure. Let's look at Australia versus the US and the currency pairs and how they match up. Should you actually go back to Australian dollars and flee US dollars? <laughs> well, that would depend on what the exchange rate is actually doing and importantly, what it's doing over a long period of time. So let's take a look. This is the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. It is 67 cents, I'm noticing there, and therefore quite clearly you're going from one Australian dollar to how many you get in US dollars. Over the one month, the Australian dollar has been going up, 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 up very nicely. Over the one year, the Australian dollar has more or less gone sideways and then, yeah, basically gone down. Wow, okay. Over many, many years, where we're talking about about 2006 onwards, the Australian dollar has gone up, then down, then up and down. It's just basically going up and down. Hmm, interesting. We can say over the short term, currency pairs are affected by trade imbalances and sentiment. Over the long term though, Currency pairs tend to perturbate around an average and have no positive nor negative expectation. This is one fundamental difference between the share market and currencies. The share market does tend to have a positive expectation. The currencies, not so much. They tend to just oscillate back and forward, but economies can shift. And if they shift, so can the currency pairs. Fundamental shifts between economies can create a new long-term average. So for example, let's say Australia was full of manufacturing. We did all our own manufacturing and then that dried up and we sent it all overseas. That would affect the trade balances and therefore the dollar could shift permanently. But then we discover gold and uranium and all sorts of exciting minerals and that can affect the trade balance again. So it is true that currencies tend to fluctuate around some sort of normal, but the normals can shift over time. Currency pairs definitely have little trends. So over the six months, ooh, the dollar's going down. But can I prove that this is not statistically important over longer periods of time? There's no positive nor negative expectation over a period of years. Well, yes, I can. As of right now, one Australian dollar equals 67 cents US. If there was a positive expectation of the Australian dollar versus the US, Next year, it would be, say, 82 cents. The year after, it would be 92 cents. The year after, it would be 117 cents. And in 2050, it would be, say, 623 cents. Positive expectation means over long period of times, it has to go up and up and up with no limit. It will keep rising and rising and rising and soon will be worth five times as much as the US dollar. Is that likely? No, it's not. And therefore, the Australian dollar does not have a positive expectation versus the US. What about a negative one? Well, this would mean next year it's down to 52 cents. The year after, 46. The year after, 33. And in 2015, it would be down to 16 cents and then maybe 8 cents and 4 cents and 2 cents. Is that my expectation that the Australian dollar is going to crash and keep crashing and keep more crashing? No. Overall, they tend to perturbate around some sort of medium. And that's just how currency pairs tend to work. So we've answered the first question. Should I convert my US dollars into Australian dollars? If it's about currency and you're prepared to hold for the long term, it makes no difference. Question number two, which is the better economy to be invested in? Yes. This is the S&P 500 this year. Wow, that has gone down quite a lot. If you're worried, Wendy, then of course, what's going on with the market in the last couple of years would be a big concern to you. 
But if we just step back for a moment and have a look at that, it's a tiny little dip over a long-term positive expectation. This is the S&P 500. So it's all a matter of perspectives. Perhaps you're 17 and you're dating for the first time. Oh, my girlfriend and I are having problems. And then your older mother or grandmother chuckles to herself and says, you will find many, many people to date along the way. Eventually you'll end up getting married. The probability is there for that. Don't worry about the little day to day. Look over the long term. The question is, if you're concerned about the US market right now, which James certainly is, what is the better alternative? So he wants to pull his money from US dollars back to Australia. Is Australia actually any better? If you're going to pull out of something, you need to know where you're going to pull it to. Well, if we have a look over the long term, the US market is in blue, the Australian market is in purple. We start off from 2013 right up to today. We're noticing the S&P 500 is outperforming the ASX 300 over time. Yes. If we have a look at the US inflation data, wow, that's gone up a lot. 7.75%. You'll notice that even from the late 80s, it's basically been fairly smooth and then suddenly it's gone to hell in a handbasket. Well, this is true, but if you pull back and look at a longer range of time, you'll notice in the 1800s, wow, that was a very rough period of time. In the 1950s, it got up there, but even within my lifetime, the inflation that we've got now is not the highest. You'll notice too that in the more recent years, inflation has been well and truly under the control. It is the Fed's remit to keep that inflation under control. So as opposed to the 70s where they sort of let it run, now they're more on top of it. Sure, it may hurt you in your interest rates. We don't like inflation going up. And so therefore they try to combat it. So in the longer term, as we look, the inflation is high now. But statistically, it's likely to come down again and the economy will get going again. So we have conclusions. The US market has a positive expectation over time. That's certainly true. No US crash has lasted forever. Well, that's true. Why would you assume this one will last? Now, it's not impossible for a booming economy to suddenly go flat, to go sideways for decade after decade. Just take a look at Japan. We go back to 1995, where it was up a bit, and then it's been coming up and down, up and down, and wow, 2003 was not a good year for them. Came up a bit, came up a bit, but now it's gone down again. More or less from 1996 right up to today, it's just been trending sideways. Well, there you go. That's true. But there's no evidence that the US market is going sideways. Sure, over the last year or two, the US market has been going down, but you only have to be pulling back five years, 10 years, and you notice that the trend of the US is clearly still up. On to the second question, which James had. Is there any way of contacting you directly? I get about five emails a week, which are basically asking all the same question. So I'm going to take one as an example, heavily redact it because privacy is important, but this is basically what they're all asking. Hello, Sebastian. I've been listening to your YouTube videos with appreciation and enjoy the dry and raw humor. Ah, thank you very much, Redacted. You seem to have come out of nowhere and it's great to have such excellent information by a knowledgeable Australian for Australians, especially in the context of so much awful information being bandied about on the platform. The platform is YouTube. I'm looking for a financial and investment advisor. Do you provide financial and investment advice or can you recommend anyone? My mobile number is Redacted. Kind regards. Because I get multiple emails a week basically asking me the same question and I'm assuming that James may be asking this, I will now give you the answer once and for all. I'm not taking on any clients and therefore I'm not able to help you on a one-to-one -one basis. I'm sorry about that and I have nobody I can recommend you to. That can be your own research. But perhaps James wasn't asking that. James may be wanting to contact me directly to ask me out on a date. In which case the answer is, oh, absolutely. Make sure you bring a box of chocolates and have me home by 10 o'clock. My father's very strict about that. Do you know, I have a secret. I know the safest ETFs for Australians right now. Well, I'm gonna watch that. Click here to find out what they are.